Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the so-called Baltic Republics, have experienced one of the highest economic growth processes in the world over the last three decades, which explains new stories like this. Statistics don't lie. In the end, we are richer than the Spanish. Lithuania and Cyprus overtake Spain in GDP per capita. And that is not all. According to World Bank data, Lithuania is in the same position as Estonia, also ahead of Spain in GDP per capita, adjusted for the price difference. And everything points to Latvia being able to reach the same point in no time. However, the journey has not exactly been a leisurely stroll in the woods. The Baltic countries had to face one of the biggest bubbles and crises in the old continent within living memory. However, they faced it in a completely different way than we are used to. We've prepared this video along with our friends from Value School. It is the story of the miracle, collapse, and and recovery of the so-called Baltic Tigers. Listen up. When the Baltic states regained their independence in 1991, after more than 50 years under Soviet rule, they practically had to start from scratch. Among other things, this meant having to design and implement their own economic policies, including, of course, fiscal and monetary policy. So where do you start? What exactly should you prioritize? Which model should you choose? After five decades of centrally planned policies, it was time for change. And to achieve change, they needed to secure one key ingredient, stability. And you see, the three Baltic republics knew exactly what they were. Three small countries, unknown in the international sphere and very poor. At that time, if one thing was clear, it was that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania needed the collaboration of international investors and companies to promote their growth and boost their development. But this is easier said than done. In order to get foreign capital into the Baltic, these three countries had to inspire confidence. And for that, they had to have stability. Political stability, social stability and also economic stability, that is, to have things like healthy public accounts, an efficient financial system, and low inflation. But of course, the question that Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians ask themselves, and that we can also ask ourselves is, how can this be achieved? How can we achieve economic stability? Well, this is exactly where the debate on the types of changes arises. That is, the debate between choosing a fixed exchange rate model where your currency can be converted to another currency at a fixed rate, or a flexible exchange rate model where exchange rates depend entirely on the market. And this is no small matter. The advantage of flexible exchange rates is that they allow an economy to better adjust to an economic shock or an international crisis. Fixed exchange rates, on the other hand, by allowing exchange rate risk to disappear, tend to achieve higher levels of confidence among institutions international investors, and therefore greater access to international financing, and also lower rates. The downside is that they severely limit a country's adjustment capacity. Well, the fact is that the three Baltic republics opted for fixed exchange rates. Thus, Estonia's new currency, the Kroon, was pegged at a fixed rate to the Deutsche Mark. The Lithuanian Lipas was pegged to the US dollar, and the Latvian Lat was pegged to the IMF's drawing rights, a real grab bag of the world's major currencies. In other words, the three Baltic republics basically gave up having their own independent monetary policy. From that moment on, keeping the exchange rate fixed became more than a priority. It also became a national duty. And believe me when I tell you, they did it against all odds, but we'll talk about that later. The point for now is that their strategy sort of worked. During the late 1990s and the beginning of the current century, foreign capital, particularly from Nordic countries and above all from Sweden, began to pour into the Baltic republics as if there was no tomorrow. This flood of capital fueled an enormous economic takeoff, with growth rates reaching over 10% per annum. Suddenly, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania became the great protagonists of change. The Baltic miracle was underway. The downside is that this massive influx of international capital meant that these three countries maintained large current account deficits for years. The problem is that maintaining large current account deficits over the long term is something that tends to fuel serious economic problems. For example, in this case, easy access to cheap international credit multiplied corporate debt and overheated the housing market. And that's not all. As is always the case, the flood of credit also boosted asset prices and financed a huge trade imbalance. For years, credit was almost unlimited. Remember that the Nordic banks, especially the banks in Sweden, were doing great business. They took very cheap capital from their home countries and poured it into the Baltic states in exchange for slightly higher rates. And since the demand for credit was enormous, the business just kept growing and growing. In fact, over time, these same banks ended up controlling more than two thirds of the entire financial system of the Baltic states. Mm. 
Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania became the golden goose for Swedish banking, and all within just a few years. The point is that with so much credit, asset bubbles and problems associated with excessive debt began to pop up everywhere. This open bar of Nordic credit fed a huge economic takeoff in the Baltic republics, but also huge financial imbalances. The hangover was gonna be rough. Listen up. In Freefall. Perhaps the ingredients that fed the crisis in the Baltic states were not so different from those we have already seen on other occasions. Unlimited credit, real estate bubbles, over-indebtedness of companies, and so on and so forth. However, what was completely different was the response of these three countries to the crisis. And of the three, the case of Latvia is perhaps the most representative. We are talking about one of the countries most affected by the 2008 crisis in the world. A country whose GDP fell by more than 25% between 2008 and 2010. Yes, really, 20 25% and their unemployment rate was not far behind. Registered unemployment rose above 20%. Let's start at the beginning. By 2007, the Latvian banking market was dominated by four large banks, three Swedish banks, Swedbank, SEB and Nordi, and one local bank, Parex Bank. Well, as we have already mentioned, the business basically consisted of the following. These entities, particularly the three big Swedish banks, financed themselves very cheaply in their markets of origin, and then derived large amounts of loans in the three Baltic republics. In this way, credit was not tied to deposits or any other local resource. The supply was in practice unlimited. Banks could lend as much as they wanted and even more. It was kind of a financial free-for-all. What's more, as this massive flood of credit spread through the economy, demand for all kinds of goods and services increased. And with that, inflation. Which in turn, and this is important, drove real interest rates deeper and deeper into negative territory. Think about it. The rates at which loans were traded depended primarily on the international market. So as inflation climbed, as demand grew in the Baltic republics, real rates sank lower and lower. In turn, this made taking out more and more loans the most most rational decision. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. Take a look at this other graph. The levels of investment in Latvia were very high, well above the levels of local savings and foreign direct investment. We are talking about a difference that came to represent 18% of GDP. And that's of course, had to be covered by all the torrential loans that came from abroad. Loans that also financed a growing trade deficit. The wheels did not stop turning. Until, stop! Along came 2007 and the international financial crisis. At that time, the imbalances in Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania were so large that the balloon was well and truly ready to burst. And that is exactly what happened. From 2007 onwards, the flow of credit slowed down more and more, until by the end of 2008, the international markets were practically dry. Suddenly, real estate prices began to fall. There were no more resources to finance the high levels of investment, and many hyper-leveraged companies began to go bankrupt, which in turn triggered unemployment, and with that, even more defaults. For example, Parex Bank, the second largest bank in the country, and the largest local bank, had to be rescued by the government. The Latvian economy went into freefall, and with it, the public deficit began to climb almost exponentially. But there was a problem. International financial markets were dry, and in this case, governments could not adjust monetary policy unless they agreed to end the fixed exchange rate model. It was time to make adjustments. And boy, did they make them. The IMF recommended that they devalue their currencies, and many economists urged them to use monetary policy to finance stimulus plans to deal with the crisis. However, no. The answer from the Baltics, and in particular from Latvia, which was the country that had the most financial problems due to having to rescue a large local bank, was a resounding no. 
and here we come to the key point. This was the surprising response that Latvia, along with the other Baltic states, gave to the 2008 financial crisis. An aggressive, unique, and surprisingly bold response. To give you an idea, in just over a year, the government implemented a fiscal adjustment plan of almost 11 points of GDP. This meant cutting all public spending by more than 25%, more than a quarter in just a few months. Latvia did what had always been thought to be impossible. By the end of 2009, the government had already announced the dismissal of 29% of all public employees, while reducing the salaries of the remaining civil servants by an average of 26%. And that's not all. It was also decided to take advantage of the moment to reorganise the entire state structure from top to bottom. For example, it was announced that 35 of the country's 59 hospitals would be closed because they were considered obsolete and unnecessary. It was also announced that more than 100 public schools would be closed and that some 2,400 professionals would be laid off. Half of all public agencies were closed and salaries in state-controlled enterprises were capped. We are talking about a titanic effort that was carried out with a very clear idea, not to touch the economic foundations of the country and its main source of long-term prosperity, the fixed exchange rate, the flat tax system, and healthy public accounts. With such an iron will on the table, the government negotiated a support package with the IMF, the European Commission, and the Scandinavian countries, which totaled some $7.5 billion, a package of which Latvia barely used a little more than half in the end. Then, in 2010, the economy began to come back to life. The crisis was coming to an end, and although the effort had been hard and unemployment had climbed above 20%, the country emerged from the crisis without touching its economic foundations and with reasonably healthy public accounts. By the end of 2010, public debt represented only 42% of GDP. This was the case in Latvia, but the stories of Estonia and Lithuania were very similar. Unlike the other republics that emerged with the dismantling of the Soviet Union, the three Baltic musketeers opted for a radical change of economic model. In a few years, they did away with subsidies, privatised the bulk of public companies, established a competitive tax model under a proportional system in which all taxpayers faced the same tax rate and opted for the containment of public spending. Even through the worst of times, these three countries held the rudder steady. The result is clear to see. So, there you have the story of one of the biggest crises in Europe in recent decades. A crisis, a real estate and credit bubble that nevertheless had a very different ending to the one that we are used to. Today, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia are three prosperous countries with very high levels of entrepreneurship and growing levels of competitiveness. But having come to this point, it's time to stop. What do you think of the Baltic Republic's response to the 2008 crisis? Leave us your answer below in the comments. And if this video made in collaboration with Value School has been interesting for you, then don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. Best regards, I'll see you next time.